What has driven me to walk? Will they be taking me for lunch? I've forgotten my toothpicks. The letter just said an invitation to pitch ideas. It's six weeks earlier, and I'm sitting in the passenger seat of my own car while my assistant drives it. Badly. Usually this would irritate me immensely, her hunched seating position a painful indication of how much she's fiddled with my carefully calibrated seat settings. But today she can adjust the steering column and even angle the wing mirrors if she likes, as long as she doesn't fiddle with the three pre-programmed seating positions which I've named Cruise, Rally and Service Station Kip, or SSK. Because I am extremely upbeat. My destination? The British Broadcasting Corporation, brackets BBC. My task? To pitch some ideas at commissioners who've responded to my assistant's mail drop by calling me in to hear more. It's an unexpected invitation for a presenter pushing 60, sure. But Utree has been a knight of the long knives for broadcasters of a certain age and has left a hole in the roster of greying presenters that not even the woman who sued Countryfile could fill. Did they seem pleased I was coming? It was just a PA, says my assistant, her face so close to the windscreen her breath keeps fogging it up. PAs can sound pleased, I tell her. Just because she's been grumpy ever since her mum died intestate, it doesn't mean she should tar other administrators with the same grey brush. Stop the car! My assistant slams on the brakes, her one and only method of braking in all honesty. She really doesn't have gentle feet, lacking what I call chiropodal dexterity. Still, we're stationary now, and I exit the vehicle just outside the Beeb, telling her I'll meet her in there. There's someone else I've just spotted across the road from Broadcasting House about to enter the Langham Hotel, Julia Bradbury. There's always been a certain frisson between Bradbury and me. I've said on air many times what an accomplished and attractive presenter she is, and she sent me a lovely message when I posted her a copy of my memoir, I Partridge, then texted to make sure it had arrived. Got your book. Thanks. I bound from the car, noticing she's with short-haired presenter Claire Balding and a well-oiled gentleman. All three are in high spirits. Hi, it's Alan. Great to see you, I shout from across the road. But they don't hear me over the traffic that clogs up every road in the city. People always tell you the streets are paved with gold in London. They don't tell you you'll need to lift a bus out of the way to get at it. I jog over the road and say, Hi, it's Alan. Great to see you. But they're deep in conversation. Julia will tell you, the man is saying to Balding. Move from the BBC to Channel 4 and the whole setup is different. Oh, very different, very different, I say, deciding to join in that way. The three of them stop and look at me. Hi, it's Alan. Great to see you, I say. Hi, Alan, says Julia. Silence. But I'm happy to fill the silence. Always have been. Two very distinct ethoses, I continue. How so? says Balding, whose surname up close is revealed to be a total misnomer. Her hair is in wonderful, thick condition. Well, Channel 4 shows start with a very British, and the BBC start with the Great British. Two very different approaches to British TV. They look at me, hesitatingly. I elaborate. Coup, brothel, sex, scandal, UFO, hoax, I say, listing the very British Channel 4 progs on my left hand. Then I raise my right. Menu, bake off, railway journeys, sewing bee. I open my hands as if to say, and there you have it, silently mouthing the words by accident and wincing at myself for doing so. Harvey Kennedy, says the man, shaking my hand. Funny, I did a little bit on railway journeys. More than a little bit, scoffs Balding, her hair becoming fuller and more lustrous every time I look at it. Well, yes, he replies, I represent Portillo. Michael and I took it to the channel. Seven series and five books later, here we are. He smiles. Well, you would. He got me the ramblings gig on Radio 4, and we've done 167 episodes, says Balding. Man, that hair. 167? Why have I never heard of it? I say, before realising it's because I don't listen to Radio 4. And Julia's done Wainwright's walks, railway walks, canal walks, Icelandic walks, continues Balding, or Balding continues. Harvey's got her walking all the way to the bank. Who commissioned that? Let me guess, Channel 4. No, I mean she's doing well financially. Oh, (laughs) I see, I say, laughing at the idea of Julia Bradbury presenting a show in which she walks from her house to the bank. Can you imagine? Although I would watch it. What can I say? People love a journey, laughs Harvey. The ladies laugh. Sod it, I laugh.
Suddenly Portillo is standing there, all pink trousers and that facial expression that looks like he's smiling but is actually just the way his features hang. Footnote. Geoffrey Hayes from TV's Rainbow suffered from the same thing. What is this? Some sort of walker's lunch? I laugh. They smile at me benignly, meaning yes. Shall we? Portillo says, and they turn to the hotel. I love a journey, I blurt out. Has anyone ever walked the M12 route, motorway proposed in the 1960s between the M11 and Brentwood? Never built, but a fascinating insight into urban... Nice to meet you, Alan, smiles Harvey. Or east to west across England's narrowest point, the belt line of Britain. Or just a rectangle around the Midlands. I'd call that one the guts of Albion. It helps if it has some historical or personal significance, you know, says Harvey Kennedy. And he pats my shoulder as if to say, I like you, Alan. By now my assistant is phoning me repeatedly, so I thank them for their chats, have a quick final glance at Bradbury, and then a quick final glance at Balding's hair, and I'm off, ready to pitch the living hell out of my ID port. Ideas portfolio. On my arrival at Broadcasting House, the PA doesn't sound pleased, but then nor would I if I had to appear in the background on BBC News every time I popped to the lavatory. Speaking of which, I tell my assistant to keep them talking while I pop to a cubicle to psych myself up. Not that I need to do much psyching. I've been summoned. They asked for me. I am so pumped. Once fully, fully razzed, I stride out and through the door, next to which my assistant is looking concerned. I am met by a depressing scene. A room full of one hundred, maybe two hundred people, none of them over thirty-five. An absolute phalanx of young TV types, armed with PowerPoint presentations, who are firing off buzzwords like there's no tomorrow, which for them I dearly hope there isn't. One man wearing a fisherman's woolly hat is on a raised stage saying something about a fashion programme for the discerning mature gent, adding that it's more George Clooney than George Lazenby. Everyone laughs, but I once shared a paella with George Lazenby, and don't. I turn to my assistant. I thought this was meant to be a one-on-one -on -one meeting. This is an open day. I'll have to check the letter. Check your eyes, woman. It's an open day. It's clearly an open day. Not to worry. And with that, we bob out of the door and head back, I drive, to Norfolk, where the only people who wear fishermen's hats are the trawler men at Brancaster. All the while discussing potential competition ideas for mid-morning matters, the digital radio show that keeps me both happy and fulfilled and content. Later that night, however, I lie awake and realise I, Alan Partridge, am in the grip of a grump. It's nothing to do with the absence of telework. It's not. I couldn't give a shit about that. No, for days, or is it weeks now, I've been sleepwalking. Footnote. Now that's not a phrase anyone would associate with Alan Partridge, not least because I've been outspoken in my doubts about sleepwalking. I'm what you might call a somnambusceptic. Don't believe it, I just don't buy it. I know some people do, you, the listener, might, but I don't. It's stupid, and I'm just not having it. Sure, you might roll over in your sleep or fiddle with your nutsack, but walking? No. The whole thing is a smokescreen, a get-out-of-jail-free card, and it just doesn't stand up to scrutiny. Raided the fridge while you're supposed to be on a diet? Sleepwalking. Took a hammer to a much-loved CD collection? Sleepwalking. Found in the spare room with your colleague Philip after your husband let him stay over because he'd had two glasses of wine and was over the limit, even though they were small glasses and he was clearly fine to drive? Sleepwalking. Come off it, Carol. I'm on autopilot. Days spool by like biz cards on a Rolodex. I've been absent-minded. The quick snap of my synapses dulled. Sudoku's left unnumbered. I'm making uncharacteristic and unforgivable mind lapses, parking in a standard space instead of the disabled bay, completely forgetting my assistant is in the car and carries her blue badge with her, opening a new adventure playground and forgetting to thank the mayor. I'd thank the kids who'd helped build it and paint it. Of course I had. Everyone had but failing to formally offer thanks to an elected official of the council, resplendent in his gown and chain, well, that's just not Alan Partridge. I always thank the mayor, and save this one unfortunate oversight, I hope to always thank the mayor. The ennui has even infected my professional life. My broadcasting is lacking the pep, the zip, the scriff, the whizzle, that until now it has always delivered. Yes, there is a hole in me. I don't mean the physical holes, the mouth, the nostrils, the ears, and the other two. This is a hole at my very core. 
a soul hole. Truth is, I've been this way for some time. I am not at peace. I feel listless. But why? I make a list of possible causes, and yet even with this list I remain listless. Is that even possible, to have a list and still be listless? Either way, it bugs the bleeding shit out of me. Footnote. Bleeding shit is merely a turn of phrase. Blood on toilet paper is a common sign of bowel cancer, and I check each sheet diligently, aware that if there are dots of red, it's generally nothing more than a rectal fissure or beetroot. I do not have bowel cancer or hemorrhoids. Yes, I am very much in the doldrums, the doldra. And late that night, it comes to a head. I'm at Denton Abbey, my Norwich home. Denton Abbey is massive and brilliant. It's the kind of house you drive past and say, Shit, who lives there? Well, I'm delighted to say the shit who lives there is me. It's 4am and I'm trying to sleep, but my mind is troubled. A segment of the one show yesterday evening had looked at heat loss in large houses, making its point using a thermal imaging camera so that the hot air escaping the roof looked like a red biro leaking ink into an upside-down shirt pocket. The report was fronted by Dom Littlewood, a presenter who looks and sounds like he won his primetime BBC One presenting job in a raffle, and probably did. He finished with a to-camera piece in which, clutching a wad of cash, he suggested an uninsulated homeowner was wasting pound, throwing away a banknote, after pound, he threw away another one, after pound, and another. This too has annoyed me. Throwing away the note on the word pound seemed to suggest that the note represented a pound, singular, but one-pound notes were withdrawn from circulation some thirty years ago. If he'd thrown one-pound coins as he said it, fine. Likewise, if he'd reworded the sentence to say pounds upon pounds upon pounds, that would also have worked, but he didn't. He threw a banknote on the word pound, and that was wrong. Lazy and wrong. I texted my son Fernando to see if he was watching. No. I explained my issue to him. Fuck's sake, Dad, does it matter? I'd explained that yes, it did matter, and this time Fernie didn't reply, suggesting that he'd changed his mind and now agreed with me. But still, this had riled me, and now, hours later, I'm all a jitter. The report itself hasn't helped either. I toss and turn, trying against try to forget the upsetting facts and figures, but they swim in front of me like so many curious carps. Carp. National Insulation Association figures point to a 66% heat loss through uninsulated solid walls, 25% through the loft slash roof space, and 20% through windows and doors. Taken together, it means houses could lose as much as 111% of their heat. I become angry at the notion of a house losing 11% more heat than it could ever have had in the first place. I try to put these thoughts from my mind, pledging instead to count sheep. I picture them running across my mind's eye, hurdling a fence gaily before gambling on. But even this riles me. I think about the fence. What farmer fences off half of his own field? No farmer. So the sheep are either leaping off his property into that of a neighbour, or they're jumping back onto his land, in which case where have they been? Do all sheep do this? Maraud across farmland while the rest of us sleep? And if so, why not make the fences higher? It's absolutely idiotic. Another reason to despise farmers. I stop myself. No more questions, Alan. Just focus on the sheep. And although this relaxes me for a while, I begin to fixate on the fleeces. In my mind, these sheep are clad not in wool, but in rock wall lagging, and after clearing the fence, they are all leaping into the joists of my neighbour's loft, cutting his heating bills by up to £250 a year. I get up, and with a grumble and a sniff, I make my way to the loft, aware that I won't achieve sleep until I've assessed the loft insulation myself. My bottom is itchy, so I stop in the middle of the landing and scratch it lightly. The fiddling merely tantalises the itch, and it becomes more aggressive. I respond in kind, dragging my fingernails across my fondament in a frenzied jerking motion. With one hand braced against the wall, I am now grabbing and clawing at the angry aperture, slashing and scraping in a bid to ease the sensation. It's a delicious relief, but I know it's merely stoking the irritation. And so, after a final flurry, scrit, 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 I stop scratching. My backside pleads with me to continue, but I resist, and in a few seconds the itch subsides on its own, as I knew it would. Footnote. Admittedly, this isn't relevant to the story, but I don't believe in flinching from the truth, however unnecessary or unpalatable it might be. 
Moreover, it contributes to the word count, and there's nothing in my publishing agreement to say what I can and can't fill the book with. Uh, I've just realized that the fifth script was pronounced skit. This was my error, and I apologize for it. I clamber up the loft ladder and grab my torch from just inside the hatch. Like a detective inspecting a murder scene, I pop the torch in my mouth, leaving my hands free for detecting and inspecting. It would work better with a slim pen torch. Mine is a fat, heavy-duty maglite, and it stretches my lips painfully, like when the cleaner's not been and there are only serving spoons left, but I press on regardless. I detect and inspect the roof space quickly, concluding that no, my roof isn't insulated. The one show had asked viewers to get in touch with their thoughts on home insulation, so, even though the program had long finished, I send an SMS to 8882 that reads, My home isn't insulated. I'm too late for today's show, but they might read it out at the start of tomorrow's. As I turn to leave the roof space, I see an old cardboard box containing various papers, old photos, and a length of tinsel. It seems to look back at me, the perforated handhold leering like a mouth. I recognize that leer, but where from? There's an otherworldliness to this box. I hesitate to describe it as an aura because that's a word generally used by women who work in offices and loudly describe themselves as spiritual. But it's as if the box has a magnetism and my eyes are made of metal. It seems to be calling to me. Hey, Alan, what you doing? You want to look inside of me? Quite camp, but maybe that's the tinsel. No, I say, for some reason, out loud. I'm tired and irritated. What is wrong with me? I pry the torch from my now sore lips, switch it off, then climb down the loft ladder, jumping the last two steps, as I always do, so I look like Neil Armstrong dismounting the steps of Eagle, the Apollo 11 lunar module, not so much a moon landing as my landing, my emphasis. I nod appreciatively. Nice line, Alan. I don't even bother slinking back to bed. I shower up and get ready for work. Like the name of a cartoon Belgian detective said in a Scottish accent, it's 1010. Footnote. Tintin. Try it. It's later that morning, and I'm ten minutes into my daily radio show, Mid Morning Matters. Footnote. For the uninitiated, Mid Morning Matters is like Andrew Marr's Sunday morning politics show, but minus the arrogance. The song you just heard was Midnight Train to Georgia, the Georgia in America, presumably rather than the failed Soviet state of the same name, where I'm sure the only midnight trains you find are the ones taking dissidents to death camps. Still, good song. I'm feeling a good deal better. Bright, alert, and upbeat enough not to mind that much when my sidekick, Simon Denton, pipes up, but whereas she was Gladys Knight, I'm glad it's mid-morning because it means it's time for your call. It's my job to introduce your call. He knows that. Besides, it's a pun that, let's be honest, didn't quite work. In the early days of our working relationship, I would have laughed out of politeness so as not to dent his fragile confidence. I happen to know he grows a full beard to obscure the part of his face that makes him most self-conscious. Footnote. Big jowls. But as time's gone on, I've realized that he simply won't learn if I indulge him, so I now respond to his weaker material by digging my fingernails into his arm or by leaving a few seconds of dead air in which his joke can flap and gasp for breath like a stricken fish. This time he's not given me that option. He is just out of my nail's range and dead air might suggest I've forgotten the topic of my own phone-in. So I rise above it and decide that on this occasion I'll show a bit of serenity and simply leave it there. Anyway, I get him later by pushing him at a urinal. Today's phone-in question is simple. What should be the eighth deadly sin? We all know the seven existing ones, pride, envy, wrath, gluttony, lust, sloth, etc. But which forms of evil should be added to the list? My suggestions are bad hygiene and using rising inflection at the end of a sentence when you're not even asking a question. It's good radio, and I feel good that it's good. But while the phone-in provokes a range of interesting opinions, clumsiness, vegetarianism, and the sheer indecisiveness of bisexuality are all solid answers, it soon descends into more trivial territory. Soon enough, the topic has been co-opted by chauvinistic tradesmen who like to call during their lunch breaks. And what began as a thoughtful philosophical debate is now just a list of things they hate about women. Shrillness, watching Hollyoaks, and taking too long at a cash machine. This isn't the highbrow debate I'd envisaged. 
I make it clear that I find this to be hateful towards women, although they do take too long at cash machines, and deliberately put on a bad record, Fairground by Simply Red, an awful piece of music that I sometimes put on when I want to annoy my own listeners. Simon looks at me as I get up to go. I can tell he's worried. This grumpiness just isn't like me. I stride out of the studio to go and do or have a wee. I barge past Dominic, don't know his second name, from our own advertising sales team. Ah, just the man, he says, I walk on. Loving the deadly sins, chat Alan, but Pizza Hut have been on, asking if you can paint gluttony in a more positive light as it's central to their business model, and they are an advertiser, so I ignore him. I said that's not a problem, Alan. I'm astonishingly grumpy. What is wrong with me? I lurch into the toilets where I find a colleague, don't know his first name, Rogers, filling the kettle from the wash basin. He insists it tastes better than the tap in the kitchenette, which sometimes tastes of chicken, but speaking personally, it would have to taste a lot better for me to want to stand patiently by a tap while two yards away men are defecating. Are you okay, he says, while human stools plop into a toilet bowl right next to his fresh water supply. Your mouth! I look into the mirror and see what he means. My mouth sports a bruise which circles it completely like a purple flesh moat, while my lips appear stretched and a bit baggy. The maglite I'd held in my mouth really had been far too big for it, and I was in little doubt that this was the worst torch-related injury I'd had, perhaps ever. My poor, lovely mouth, the mouth that had once suckled on my mother's teats, that first kissed Carol, that later kissed many other better kisses, that I used quite literally as a cake hole, that I used to utter the words that made me a comfortable living. It was staring back at me, slack and gaping, and circled by a bruise in a grotesque parody of a ring road. Well, this is the last thing I need. I'm brand ambassador for Corsadol mouthwash for the whole of Anglia, not just East, and it's a contractual stipulation that I maintain a healthy mouth. Footnote. As well as tweet daily about mouths, mouthwash, gums, fresh breath, and great taste of Corsadol. And don't slag off Corsadol. One look at this and they'll be well within their rights to stop my retainer and take back the pallets of Corsadil they delivered to my garage. My mouth looks and is very sore indeed, and I'm convinced it's misshapen. Why hasn't it sprung back? You'd expect it to spring back. The lips are stretched and ruddied, but when I attempt to smile, I stop and stare. I'm looking at a familiar leer. It's the same leer I'd seen in the handhold of the cardboard box, and now I think of it, the same leer my father used to do. I feel something rise up inside me like a phoenix, but a scaled down one that fits into a tummy. It's as if the parallel I saw in that contused, slack smile had some meaning. Was there any meaning in this? That my mouth resembled the handhold of a cardboard box which in turn resembled the grin of my long-deceased father? I had to know. I returned to the studio and rushed through the rest of my show. Footnote, although it ended at 2 p.m. regardless. I am sitting in front of the box in my loft. What could it contain? I open it gingerly. Usually I avoid opening boxes I don't recognize. Ever since a time looking for printer paper when I found what I thought was a brown paper bag of humbugs, only to discover they were dead wasps in a dormant nest. But did I realize before eating one? Footnote. Yes, I did which I appreciate makes the story a bit less interesting. More importantly, as a major public figure, it pays to be vigilant about suspect packages. This comes from personal experience. When North Norfolk Digital was sent a box of heavy metal CDs, footnote, that's heavy metal CDs rather than heavy metal CDs. Muggins here was about to open it when fellow DJ Rudy Gibson shouted over, Careful, Alan, that contains anthrax. I hesitated, instantly and effortlessly aware that the spores of the bacterium Baculus anthracis were used by bioterrorists in an increasingly common form of male attack. Pardon? I said. Can you repeat that, please? I said, careful, that contains anthrax. I looked at him, scarcely able to believe what he was suggesting. But he continued in more emphatic tones. The box of heavy metal CDs, Alan, contains anthrax. You understand? Anthrax. He looked around as if puzzled by my response, but I guess lesser guys would have panicked. Instead, I was centering myself, 
stepping slowly away from the box and breathing in loudly and powerfully through my nostrils before exhaling in short, fast bursts. <sighs> like that. I ran to my car, pulling off my jumper and shirt, then stood at my boot, slathering and rubbing my hands, face, chest and neck with handfuls of swarf eager, while my colleagues watched from upstairs windows, checking I was OK. Of course, I quickly realised Gibson had been joking, and that Anthrax was the name of a heavy metal band or singer whose CD might have been in the box. I looked up at the window and waved and laughed, and dressed, and mused on how fantastic it was to have colleagues who could share practical jokes like this. Sure enough, I got into the spirit and played a practical joke on Gibson by getting my assistant to phone him during one of his shows to tell him his elderly mother had had a fall. He was all over the place. But still, I think twice before opening strange packages. Yet here I am, peering into the rectanguloid cardboard chamber, the box. I pull back the flaps, relieved to find neither dusty wasps nor anthrax, and see, oh my God, I don't believe it. The box, the handle of which resembles the smile of my father, remember, contains bits and bobs that once belonged to my father. And here I am, with baggy lips that also resemble my father, looking at the personal effects of that father. You have to admit, that is a staggering coincidence. It's as if someone or something is trying to speak to me. And there will be those who doubt that I'd stretched my lips in the first place, or who don't believe that a cut-out hand looks anything like a mouth, or who, in any case, think this all feels conveniently neat, Eamon Holmes, or a confused mess, my publishers, or a blatant attempt to drum up poignancy, my publishers. To those people I say, are you calling me a liar? And there'll be those who say, yes, actually, and to those people I say, lawyer up. Footnote. Get a solicitor. This actually happened. Why would I lie about it? I look down at the box. I gulp loudly. And like that, I am transported back in time, spinning through space in front of a backdrop of calendars, alarm clocks, and newspaper cuttings. Or I would if this were a movie. It's the 20th of February, 1995. I'm standing by a graveside the wind whistling through my hair like a wind whistle. My father died on the 15th of February and has now been buried. At a sparsely attended funeral, his casket has been blessed and lowered into the ground. I'm invited to be the first to throw earth into the grave. I crouch down and, unsure of how much to put in, brackets, why don't they just tell you, I push up my jacket sleeves and use both arms to sweep an enormous mound of earth from behind me and into the hole, like a couple of arm bulldozers. I figure the more dirt I put in, the more helpful I've been, and I'm about to sweep in a second mound when I look up, my shirt sleeves stained jet brown by khaki soil, and I realize this isn't the done thing. My mother tuts and looks away. My father had no savings to speak of. Mum tells me he didn't believe in savings, preferring instead to enjoy his money by buying a new sofa every two years. Footnote. He used to say, if you die owing money, you've beaten the system. And when you think of that, you get a measure of the man. I'm handed a box of his personal articles and put them in the car boot, and there they remain until I pay a younger, fitter man to pop them in my loft. And there they remain until now. I haven't looked inside because I find photographs of other people boring and receive enough mail on my own without wading through someone else's. Back in my loft at Denton Abbey, I digest the contents of the box hungrily, although I don't eat them, but it contains little more than jottings, scribbled directions, a couple of letters, service station receipts. I have to admit that my initial reaction is one of disappointment. It's all pretty meaningless, unless... Wait a minute. Seconds later, I am a blur of activity. It would work well as a montage sequence set to a piece of pop music. I am sellotaping maps, letters, receipts and diary pages to the slanting walls of the loft. Then I'm fixing pieces of garden twine to connect the relevant items together. I'm piecing together the movements and motives of a very particular incident in my father's life. I stand by and assess my handiwork, struggling to see what it could all mean. But then I take a further step back, forgetting the roof space is now a lattice of twine, a cat's gradle, stretching from one side to the other. 
I trip backwards into it and am snared in the twine like a naked man trapped in the web of a giant information spider. Footnote. I forgot to say I took my clothes off because it was hot. And it's there, as I lie prone and chafing, that it all falls into place. This box tells of a journey my father made, an important journey, a journey of hope to secure a better future for him and his family, a journey from Norwich to the nuclear power plant at Dungeness for a job interview. It contains a cut-out ad for an opening with British Nuclear Fuels Limited at their power plant in Dungeness, plus a copy of a letter from my father applying for a position at British Nuclear Fuels Limited. My father had always been fascinated by science and the possibilities of nuclear fusion, albeit not enough to study it or anything. So when a position arose with BNFL, for my money the daddy of UK nuclear power, it stood to reason that he'd throw his hat into the ring. The box contained a letter from BNFL inviting him for an interview, plus a letter from him accepting the invitation, plus a letter from BNFL confirming the date and time, plus a letter from my father thanking them for their confirmation and confirming his confirmation, and asking them to confirm their receipt of his confirmation plus a letter from BNFL confirming receipt of my father's confirmation and informing him that thenceforth there was no need for any further confirmation. The box also contained scribbled directions showing that he had drafted three different routes from his home to the power plant before scribbling two out and circling the one he planned to take on the morning of his appointment. I smile. Chip off the old block, me. Although I have my assistant plot five routes and then I choose my favourite. But the box also contains various receipts for purchases of fuel and sandwiches, brackets 10 sandwiches, from various points along the route. Footnote. My father loved sandwiches and would always chew a sandwich before eating a meal. But hang on, I think, still in my twined prison like a low-tech piece of anti-gravity training. The timings don't add up. His purchases go on through not just the morning, but the whole day until the early hours of the next morning. Also in the box is a letter from BNFL expressing its regret that since my father had failed to attend the interview, his application would be taken no further. What happened? Why did he not show? What is the answer to this mysterious mystery? And then I see it. There on the rejection letter are watermarks, clear circles where liquid has dripped onto the parchment. Footnote. Paper. Could these be? the tears of my father. I fail to see what else could have caused them, positioned as they were in a dry box in a dry loft. Later, when I show the letter to my assistant, who by her own admission, or mine at least, can be a right snark, she brings up the fact that the roof had leaked the previous winter, but I know my father's tear marks when I see them. Does she honestly think she knows my father better than me? And now I think about it. I realize my father had never been the same after this day. I know because I remember. Yes, this had truly been a pivotal moment for the Partridge family. Footnote. Not the TV show. Up until this point, Dad had been a wonderfully avuncular figure, certainly to me since he spent most of his time with my cousins. He was a jovial chap who loved life and, as I say, sandwiches. After this point, I honestly don't think a sandwich ever passed his lips. He seemed greyer, sadder, hunched of shoulder and quick to temper. An absolute sod of a man, if I'm honest. Imagine the withering acerbic put-downs of Rupert Everett, directed at an eleven-year-old boy who's just trying to learn to ride a bike, and you'll have a sense of the man's entertaining nature. He saw out his days in the job he'd held for years, at a dealership for Massey Ferguson, a U.S. manufacturer of tractors and farming machinery, all of which were powered by diesel rather than controlled nuclear fusion, and remains so to this day. He became a hard man to be around, and you'll remember, in my autobiography, I wrote some hard-hitting things about him that worked well in the tough upbringing section. Could professional disappointment have been what made him so bitter, like it did with BT Sports race stops? I wriggle free from the twine, my fall broken by a carpet of foil-backed polyurethane. Seems the loft is insulated after all, but anyway. And my eyes are filled with tears like a big baby because of the dad thing, not because of the fall or the insulation, although I am delighted about that. It's the realization that maybe, just maybe, I've judged my father too harshly. But now I've been gifted an insight into my father's life, a second chance to get to know him. 
Suddenly everything is clear. The reason for my restlessness, my listlessness, my, my zestlessness. The reason I am not at peace, despite my living in a pretty F-off house. There is a peace missing deep within me. And now I know what I must do. I must complete the journey that my father never could. I must do it on foot. Can't remember why. It will be called The Footsteps of My Father Walk. And I must complete The Footsteps of My Father Walk to reach out across the gap between this world and the next, to clasp my father's fingers and do right by him, to honour his memory and in doing so learn more about him and in doing so learn more about myself and in doing so create truly compelling copy. Alan! I feel my name being whispered down the wind as if his spirit is speaking with me. Alan! 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 Then I realise it's my assistant shouting. She sounds panicky because I've ignored the doorbell. She is a ridiculous woman. Every time I don't answer the door because I'm toweling off or thinking or grumpy, she assumes the worst. Just because her former friend, a retired policeman, was found dead at home, she assumes we're all going to succumb to a stroke. Her yelling continues until I answer the door, to find her on her knees shouting through the letterbox, like a gynaecologist bellowing into a woman. <laughs>